All right, next we have Christian Kmeyer. He is a VC and uh, primarily in blockchain technologies. And he is going to join us to talk to, about what he's looking at when he is thinking about investing in privacy and um, the things that he sees. Because as you can imagine, he's seen a picture too. Um, and so from this point of view, I thought it was important to hear the perspective of someone who makes a decision on whether I'm going to invest in you or not. So Chris, thank you so much for sharing the secret sauce here. Take it away. It's all yours. <laughs> Anytime. So fair warning, I give very long talks on subsets of the things that I'm going to address here. So it's going to be quick. I try to make this most useful for people who are interested in building solutions in the space and want to pitch us on that. So essentially, I'm going to point out a our own thesis and then some of the things that people should know. And as a VC, I'm obliged to first do the necessary disclaimer here. So I'm going to play this real quick on fast forward. So excuse me. Provided in the following presentation must not be construed as financial, legal, or any other professional advice. The mention of any company name or project by the material or speaker must not be considered an endorsement to make specific investment decisions. The views represented here are that of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers or affiliated organizations or any of its officers or subsidiaries. Please always seek independent advice before making financial or investment decisions and remember if you're not paying for a service chances are that you are the product that is being sold so i wrote an article about this that uh, you're not a google user but you're a google product about 14 years ago and at the time that was kind of a novel idea today hopefully it's an accepted fact that uh, if you're using google you are actually not using google but you're a non-player character in a game called google and so like piggybacking on that theme, I'm going to walk you through a typical outline of how your presentation to us should look like. And then we go into more specific things. So there are specifically, what is our thesis on this space? How do we look at the space? We looked at several hundred projects over the past couple of years. My own background was initially in software engineering before I became a lawyer, and but I've been in VC for more than 20 years, mostly looking at network technologies. So this is how your outline should look like. It's surprising that most uh, decks that we get uh, don't actually look like that. It's pretty straightforward. And keep in mind, you want to actually have a conversation with your counterpart and not like barrage them with information that chances are we already know and might even know better than you at this point in time. So keep it short, keep it sweet. Make sure to check off these um, seven items. And we look at every startup as an experiment on our own thesis. And you should look at your own startup as an experiment to prove out the thesis that you have on a particular problem that you're trying to solve. Right? So in very broad terms, our thesis is pretty simple. Uh, we look at decentralized software solutions fundamentally as disrupting how data is being created, how it's being transferred, stored, and governed. And for those who haven't heard of the term decentralized software solutions, it's our term we use internally. Um, blockchain is one of the examples of decentralized software solutions. There is many others like uh, directed acyclic graphs and otherwise cryptographic Mac primitives. Um, but most people will understand the space as blockchain and uh, people also refer to it like you just did as blockchain technology. The, there's a lot of confusion and conflation. I give long talks on, on that topic, but it's important to get the language right. And that's a constant problem that we are having because these topics in, exist at the intersection of engineering and legal concepts. And unless you learn the basic language of both, it's very hard to have a useful conversation. So we actually are publishing a library or it's actually live on GitHub that explains just some of the fundamental terms because if you as an engineer don't understand the difference between authentication, verification, certification uh, from a legal perspective and you want to actually create legally relevant outcomes in meet space, it's going to be very hard for you to actually program that. Essentially, you are unable to. A uh, brief overview, basically we're getting to the TAM, the total addressable market, just starting with data breaches and a warning the, the the reason why the slide or the graph goes down at the end is simply when the data was taken, it's actually consistently going up. So these are data breaches in the United States, which is approximately every hour costing a company more than $8 million on, on average. And these are only the list of reported data breaches. And it takes on average about 80 days to contain that. 
And I'm just going to jump through a couple of slides that basically speaks to TAM in some shape or form, but it also kind of um, outlines kind of the necessity of certain paradigm shifts that I'm going to talk about. So last year, the cost of cybercrime exceeded $6 trillion. As a frame of reference, that's larger than the GDP or of Japan or Germany. Actually, there's only two gross domestic products around the planet that are larger than that, which is the United States and China on current trajectory. This number will reach about 10 trillion by 2025. So my point here is changing the way we are doing um, data distribution, data storage and data creation. The latest one is actually the most important one is not a matter of optionality. This is a matter of being able to be a viable business in the future. Then, as you guys all know, there is a lot of very confusing regulation out there. I taught privacy law right after law school more than 20 years ago, specifically to call center agents in Germany to tell them what they can and cannot divulge when people were calling in. But it's very hard for people to understand this, even if you are in the legal realm. So needless to say, that makes it even harder for engineers to implement these rules. And I'm going to point out how to just walk around that essentially uh, we got a lot more regulation i'm going to jump over that anecdotally most people will already know that the reason why i'm bringing this up here in terms of what are the big cases i.e yahoo's big data breach where they paid fines for that were back then the highest one of 85 million then the, the fine that uber paid of uh, 180 or 148 million then the the pretty prominent Equifax breach where everybody's suffering still from today. And what's my point? My point is here, these are companies and here are some more on the next slide that can basically write this off as a cost of doing business. That's not true for most startups, obviously. If they incur some type of data breach that reaches this level of severity, that company is just out of business, right? So if you uh, are hit with a fine, that's a couple hundred million dollars and uh, in um, fine volume, then at that point in time, your company just falters and doesn't exist anymore. Unfortunately, um, companies that sell social engineering as a service like Google and Facebook can absorb this at this point in time. I don't think they will be able to absorb this in the future. And I hope to see business models that make it so. Then a topic that's not often mentioned in the context of data breaches and privacy is specifically BSA ML violations. Um, personally, I think that the companies that are taking custody of your personal identifiable data in the context of financial information actually have a higher obligation and should not be sharing it in the way they are doing it today and or not implementing EML regulations that are typically labeled as KYC, know your customer regulations which is kind of a window dressing term for what they're actually doing, which is literally wholesale financial surveillance of all your personal identifiable data. Every time you commit a financial transaction in any shape or form hits your demand deposit account, so your checking account. So the point here being as we, we see forcing functions, I'm gonna talk about that in some of the next slides, that in my opinion will ultimately do away with that particular procedure, i.e. In most cases, you should actually not, as a financial service provider, attach personal identifiable data to transactions, but only if when where there's a narrow legal requirement, i.e. a warrant that requires you to divulge that. Because if you all just look at your last 100 transactions that you did with your demand deposit account, your checking account, you'll probably notice you could have done all of these with cash and there was no need to actually share that information because you were just paying for your car, you were just making your rent or mortgage payment. So the macro thesis here is pretty simple as in all data that's committed to a database is basically stolen or abused at some point in time. So the answer to that is don't commit data to a database. You cannot protect databases, and we're going to show that in a different slide, because they're just creating honeypots, and it really doesn't matter how many guardrails you're installing, because the ultimate hacking is not that of electronics, it's something else. So you got a bunch of different attack vectors, network insecurity, software bugs, 
social engineering. And the last one is actually the most important one. That's about 80% of all quote unquote data breaches. And so this is kind of the gobbly gob landscape that you see today, all these companies that together generate some 200 billion revenues every year. They're doing sort of what I would refer to as security theater and address 20% of the the actual surface structure by 80% is unprotected. And that 80% is that, that little guy down there in the middle. And we can talk about this in the Q&A more. The large part that I need to, everybody to understand is um, this particular paradigm shift. Because what I see on a daily basis uh, to some extent, or oh, I just see that this is skewed. Let me move this over. So to what I heard earlier again, and that's something but that we heard several hundred times is basically engineers trying to solve the problem on the same level was created and it's very important to understand that we now have the opportunity due to a paradigm shift that decentralized software solutions so blockchain be one example introduced to fix that what's my point my point is that we came from the pre-digital area with era which is not that long ago it's just the the early 60s when we were still recording most of our transactions in papers and you had some physical documents that you used for authentication, verification, certification, let's think like your passport, before we introduced database solutions and then made, we kind of made an architectural error by connecting these database solutions to network technologies. And so essentially what we're doing right now, we're fixing the violations of the past where we are disconnecting networks from these systems so from any kind of storage systems that require permissions layer and rather building the permissions into the documents itself if actually need to create a document i'm going to talk about that more but uh, that's usually a longer talk the larger point there is um, you want to look for forcing function that force you to adapt your technology to do that because we will ultimately invalidate everything else so over the past decade, we actually created a database of companies where we think uh, they have something that we call internally toxic data stored in the databases. We're going to invest in solutions that will identify those and make it a business model to put these companies out of business because we need to clean up the digital landfill, which um, we unfortunately call the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web doesn't exist yet. Um, it's the commercial web that you're using. You're not on the web when you're using Google or something else. We are super early in the development of that. Only less than 5% of people actually use a, a runner. So you use an actual secure browser, which we today call a, bra um, a wallet usually. Uh, it's really not a wallet. We just call it that. These are runners that um, are able to handle credentialing in a cryptographically secure form and let you access data, manipulate data. And they are specifically only moving forward as in you don't get to erase data, which is an important point. Again, sorry for the brevity. That probably requires a lot more explanation. Uh, There's an important slide explaining the actual, I call it Web3 stack here, as I mentioned. Um, Web3 is a useless marketing term introduced by some VCs to raise money. Uh, we are really pre-Web 1.0 still. We haven't built the web yet. Um, and we've been using this marketing term Web3 for the past 20 years at this point in time on and off. But the larger point there is, um, is, is to realize where are you building? What technologies are you building? Are you on the actual protocol layers? It's important to understand that a lot of people refer to blockchains are protocols. They are not. They are applications. They are protocols only in the sense of business logic, not in the network sense. So as you can see, blockchains make use of network protocols. But there's a lot of applications and uh, solutions that are being decentralized right now that we need to actually build the World Wide Web. So decentralized compute, decentralized addressing, uh, decentralized bandwidth and so forth. All of these are being built right now, but they are very, very, very nascent at the moment. But that's what we are looking at. So as I mentioned earlier, forcing functions. If you have an iPhone, uh, open up your wallet and then click on the little plus button and you will see that there's two states now that allow you to add your driver's license to that. And it's a particular implementation as a cryptographic primitive that you store on your enclave. And so the point there is, this is a forcing function as in this particular primitive 
um, is actually communicating digitally through encrypted communication directly between the device and the identity reader. So users don't need to unlock, show, or hand over the device and so forth. And obviously, the recipient usually shouldn't get wholesale information of your personal identifiable data. But uh, when it talks to TSA, it should basically just get a green check mark. And for whatever reason, the slide keeps moving around for me. Um, so in the past, we had browsers. Ultimately, there will be runners. Maybe we're still going to call them browsers, but they will hold the cryptographically secure informa um, information about you and the access to the data that you can um, communicate. So my expectation is that we just intermittently stream access to data that a service needs, again, to reverse the paradigm. And I'm going to talk about this some more. You see the nascent implementations of that. So you, you, you see um, the implementation of a wallet that you can add as a plug into your browser, or you, you see um, browsers that already integrate runners like Opera and um, Brave, for example. Uh, this is architecture that specifically refers to that. I'm going to jump through that, explain the big picture, and then we can talk about the line items on your pitch. But I want to leave a lot of time for questions because I think that's probably largely confusing. I'm going to post a, um, a link to an article that I wrote to explain topology and to some extent some of the terminology that you need to understand to have a useful discussion with us or build useful solutions in the space. So it's important to understand that we're reversing the network topology to simplify this massively. Right now, when you're exposed to digital solutions, so what you call the World Wide Web, you're basically exposed to a push paradigm. As soon as you put the letter D into Google, you're top of funnel and you're being pushed towards an end that will increase ultimately shareholder value for Alphabet, the holding company um, that runs Google. And everything else is a subset of that. So all the social engineering solutions as a service that they offer to their customers, which are not really advertisers, because obviously Google is not a search engine. It doesn't, doesn't care about the outcome. It just cares about um, increasing shareholder value ultimately. Um, so the important part to understand is we will look specifically for applications in the future that still do that, because that shouldn't have been legal to begin with. But ultimately, what we want to do is we want to have you, everybody who's listening right now, own what we internally call all your digital dust. If you ever watched any of our episodes that Jeff and I do on Friday, your bites, your rights, we're analyzing um, any type of data from that particular perspective, as in if when we are uh, is this available as a cryptographic primitive, i.e. credentials, like the government issued credential I mentioned earlier, and at what point in time is it investable? T investing is all about timing. Um, at that point in time, you want to jump into that particular game. Unfortunately, we so see or have seen over the past 20 years a lot of solutions that were just too early and too early in our space. Uh, it's the same as being wrong, unfortunately, even though there's good intentions. It's just unfortunately not understanding where we are in the technology paradigm, what other prerequisites need to exist, i.e. you couldn't have usefully invested in a, um, a video streaming service. And there were hundreds of that before YouTube came around until we have broadband uh, adoption widely uh, across the wider population. Anyway, so I'm going to make uh, like this outline available, I'm probably going to also publish a short article on Hackanoon where you also find a lot of these concepts explained in greater detail. But I wanted to make sure that I leave 10 minutes at least to answer some questions that are probably coming up. All right, Heidi, you want to ask something? <laughs> that was probably... Uh, like looking back, that's probably more confusing than anything else. <laughs> um, you know what? Can you put that one, that that last one, back up? Um, sure. The the, yeah. the one about like the line items. I'm gonna publish Do it that. In Ten minutes. Yeah, because I I teach people okay. how to pitch all the time. Yeah, keep your sure. slides between seven yeah. and two slides. Keep it definitely under you know ten minutes. Um, you need to talk about what the problem is, how you intend to solve it, uh, what your financials are, why you should be the person to solve it who your yeah. advisors are and what they want from you. The ask is important and it's also the most difficult part people have coming up with because the ask is always money, but how much money do you need? 
What did you base yeah. that on? What are you going to do? Ultimately, with it? it's simple, Heidi, right? So ultimately, it's super simple. As a VC, what's our job? Our job is two things. We have to A, be able to prognosticate the future to some extent within our investment horizon, right? So our investment horizon on our end is pretty long. Uh, we don't spray and pray. Uh, we live off the success of the investments that we make. And so we look at uh, the availability of these solutions and the viability of these solutions. And I, I'll break this down um, over a 10 year horizon. So can these solutions be viable A, from a technology perspective and then B, from a business model perspective? And we will, as I mentioned, we will actively invalidate of the, a lot of the solutions that people keep investing in because they just double down on the violations of the past. So what we have is a very, very detailed uh, due diligence check that checks for usual violations that we see on a daily basis. I'll mention one and then we can move on because it gets very, very nitty gritty here. Um, a lot of companies that we see right now, they jump on these ideas of blockchain based solutions and then they're using it kind of in a database fashion, i.e. they're creating new records. It, the only reason to use the decentralized software solutions, i.e. a blockchain, is to move control over a set of bytes from A to B. Chances are, and those chances are like 99%, if you're committing any data, any immutable record to your application, at that point in time, and you know this as well as I do, you probably what we call internally invalidate the herd immunity of your application because now you can no longer comply with certain laws and regulations. The obvious mm -hmm. one being the right to be forgotten. You cannot forget, quote unquote, an immutable record. And actually, the next show we're going to do next week is a dealing with the perma web. So that's dealing specifically um, with data systems that create immutable records on purpose um, for with the intent that these uh, records will exist forever. But this is just like one of these examples, but I we see this every day, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very unfortunate, right? Because those, um, those entrepreneurs have the right ideas, they have the right motivation, but they A, don't, um, they, they don't learn the, the, the language of the space. So, we have to spend unfortunately a lot of time just eliciting what do you mean by by this term digital identity so i'm the chair of the banking and finance at the uh, like the decentralized identity foundation i want to get rid of this term as you know uh, it's just a metaphor right so what do we really mean by that right so explain what you actually mean by that and i refer to this as kind of the agency attribution layer from a digital perspective but again if you cannot even define it and explain that it's going to be impossible for you to code that right so that that's your starting point and as i said so i give very very long talks just about that particular viability framework because i want these companies to succeed right so we are investing in these topics because we want to um, see these solutions in in the world and unfortunately because people just don't spend enough time on learning basic legal concepts or topology concepts, i.e. what overall topology are we building right now? So they're trying to solve the problem on the level it was created. So that they're looking at the existing systems, which are kind of these, let's call it PHP MySQL database uh, solution. They're trying to evolve from there. It's not about evolving from there. It's, it's the, um, it's important to realize that you should always ask, you have to ask yourself first, what's the first step? The first step is always data creation. That's why I posted earlier. Oftentimes you, you shouldn't create certain data to begin with, right? And then if you're creating it, you need to create, probably create it in a spe very specific form. And I'm simplifying it massively, but it should probably be a cryptographic primitives where you can assign control to the actual owner of this data. Ultimately, mm -hmm. our demand is that everybody should have property rights to all their digital dust. It doesn't matter if that's currencies, right? So if that's your US dollar, if that's Bitcoin or if that's credentials that are being issued by governments, you should have um, rights that are akin to property rights, which we can do from a technology perspective. We have been able to do this for a decade, but on a daily basis, we just see these double down violations of the past, people using DLTs, which are not blockchains, doubling down on the violations that we, that we're trying to fix for. Anyway, you always have to interrupt me, as you know, because uh, <laughs> 
No, it's, uh, it's fascinating. I agree with you. If we cannot get into, you know, the decentralized um, practice that we want to with our digital future until we can have agency over our data and then we can truly build decentralized systems. Um, so I'm with you. I also like the idea of considering the digital wallet as your browser. Um, yes. Because you set your privacy settings and forget it. That's what I want to do. When I go and I want to surf, I don't want to read your policy and tell you what I think about it and, you know, click these and, you know, dark pattern buttons and find my way through. I want to set it at the browser level and then keep going because I hit so many different websites that I, I'm not going to go back and, and remember to tell them all delete my data. Yes. So, uh, from yeah. an architectural perspective, that's the only option, really, if you think about it. It's just impractical, right? Mm -hmm. So Jeff aggregated all these privacy agents and whatnots, but... I mean, that's Sisyphonian to try to do that, right? And the point is always the same. It's utterly naive to request um, that digital system should forget your data. Obviously, no, the they're going to get another data dump in 15 minutes and you're in there again. So, I mean, as soon well, as they No, not only that, but the second this it, data, yeah. But the second this data is created, it's being duplicated and distributed. Yeah, right. within the code. So, code so is, it doesn't matter if you're asking one entity to for, forget it. And plus, a, as soon as um, another app is requesting that, chances are they have a complete copy of all your other personal identifiable data on average, a couple of thousand records that, that they use to profile you because it's in their best interest if they socially engineer you into that particular behavior that increases their own shareholder value. I want everybody to think of this differently, as in your first test should always be, this technology should be most useful to the user. How do you make it most useful to the user? Do you let the user set his or her intention before engaging with the, the solution? And so I, I typically refer to that as whenever I engage with any technology, I want to first set my motivation. I want to get happier, healthier, better off financially, whatever my objective are, but I want to set that. And that's a default setting. And that doesn't include KPIs like time on site, how much of my time you, you're wasting. Because if you think about this, on average now, uh, people in the United States spend two hours on social media a day, times 100 million. Just multiply this by minimum wage. That's is 99% of time is just wasted, right? And that's because people are being turned into these little lab rats feeding uh, their amygdalas to do certain functions. I want to like something more or whatever else that is. So you want to preempt this, like the metaphor in Meatspace I use for that. It's akin of um, having a self-driving car now and you sit down in your self-driving car and the self-driving car decides what route to take and where to go. Right, so that's at the moment how we allow network technologies and this digital landfill that people keep calling the World Wide Web yeah. allow to exist. That's where which, we can. That has been absurd to me uh, for 14 years, and is absurd to me today. Actually, gets absurder by the day. Now um, we finally have people in Congress waking up to it, so they are that close to actually understanding the real problem. Right? Yes, but, but the real problem is so much also bigger. Yeah. yeah, they're the also problem, under the burden of lobbying for money so that they can keep the data flowing so they can get more. Sure, money. yeah, the, there's def, definitely an incumbent problem and uh, yeah, motivated reasoning, key street money, and so forth. So that These people are not going to solve my problems. That, that informs people of that, but it's important to understand. So, like most people kind of think of privacy as that's a box that I check when I engage with a new service, right? Unfortunately, you should really think about this differently. You, you should think about this. You're giving up your agency. You're giving up a piece of self-determination. You're, you're allowing um, a software solution and by extension, whoever is operating that software solution, which is typically a commercial entity to mess with your agency, to mess with the only thing that's limited in your life, with, which is your time and attention or your, specifically your attention, measure and time. That's, on, that's the only thing that's limited. And that's being stolen from you second by second, minute by minute right now with those legacy solutions. So we are interested in making both offensive and defensive investments. So what I mean by that, A, we need to clean up this digital landfill. So we need to identify those 4,000 and more companies that have data in their possession that they shouldn't have had in the first place and invalidate those, put them out of business, right? They shouldn't exist. Oh and so those, those button feeders, purple see, um, people search companies and every data broker in between, 
Well, there is no legitimate reason to exist. Neither should there be business models that sell social engineering as a service, right? Because that's actually the major form of hacking, like I mentioned earlier, social engineering. But yet, for some reason, we allow companies to exist to sell this as a service, engineering people into best case into just wasting their time. Um, the middle case is to buy something that they wouldn't have otherwise bought if I didn't know more about you than you know about yourself using my particular database, my particular profile in technology. And then the, the worst case and my contention would be that's happening every day. There's people that are being physically harmed yes. on a day to day basis. And that could be either due to the fact that they are gravitating to some misinformation that's being presented by some form of artificial ecosystem eco chamber created around you and entice you to drink bleach to so, so, um, to save yourself from COVID, or it's something to the extent of we implement a foreign agent at a social media company who then hands over a few thousand records of dissidents to an authoritarian government and those dissidents then disappear right mm -hmm. so it's a safety yeah, issue yeah yeah and so and we we did a separate show on that but like for every t for every person that's being quote unquote caught by like eml enter money laundering ish um, matters there's probably on the order of 100 to 1000 people that are being harmed that are just um receiving funds from a source outside of the country that's being sent to them from a well-meaning organization that's trying to support the democratization of uh, certain minorities or something else in a foreign um, state. And as a result of that monitoring, these people are being identified and then disappeared. So we're not accounting for these externalities. That's my larger point. What, what, what we really need, and that's why what I call this agency attribution layer, is basically these digital forensic tools that surface these externalities on a minute by minute basis, essentially, like from a user experience perspective, I want to do not call us on all my personal identifiable data, I want to get a notification on my smartphone that will just say, Oh, someone's trying to profile you. Right now, it's like swipe left. I don't want that, right? Delete everything that you have about me by just well, careful what you wish for. You're going to be swiping a lot if you get something like that. Those nudge notices, and then you have dark oh, patterns with a nudge notice. Like, oh. uh, sure. I mean, the first thing is awareness, though. That's my point, yeah. right? So, you, you we people don't have that awareness that they're uh, like harmlessly, quote unquote, engaging with some funny little game on a website, not realizing that this mm -hmm. particular game is social engineering you due to the fact that they already have thousands of data points on you, including where you ate last night. Right? Yeah, if people are not worried about location tracking, right. it's because they haven't been stalked. So yeah, or, or talk have someone other... who's been stalked and you, you will quickly find the value in trying to secure your privacy in any way that you can. It's it's yeah. a safety issue at this point. So yeah, I'm glad we're raising awareness. At this point, we're we're gonna um, move on to the next speaker. But I sure. want to give you a last minute to wrap up. If you had any other um, closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, pitch us if you have a solution in this space. Uh, let me post a link in the uh, LinkedIn chat that speaks to the topology aspect. Simply, um, and it's kind of a storytelling matter that's hopefully helpful. Yeah, that um, was so inside the, the private chat inside stream. Yeah, so, we'll, yeah, uh, we can so throw that out on LinkedIn. Yeah, I just posted on LinkedIn as well. So the point there being is what we see, again, it comes back to trying to solve a problem on the same level was created, you know, that people by and large don't realize the topology that we're working towards. So it's kind of the reversal of the paradigm from a push to a pull paradigm, unless you realize that. You basically cannot build a viable application and we will actually actively after you insist on building that invalidate that solution, ultimately investing in companies that will look for those violations of the past and put you out of business. So don't do that. If you have good intentions <laughs> and realize okay. what we're working towards, there's lots of business models to be had that serve humans in an ethical way. And at the same point in time, help you to clean up this digital landfill. Well, Chris, I got to tell you, one of my favorite VCs, because you think this way, I wish all the VCs that I knew would think this way. I, I send them over to, to say, why don't you listen to this guy and you might make better investments. So, yeah, if you got some other VCs fishing around, finding out what you're doing, I send them to you.
Yeah, I'm much. <laughs> We're gonna move on to Caitlin now. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie.